Hi, everybody. We have a fun conversation coming up with Simon Chikoisky today. Simon's the author of a few books. I've done some interviews with him on Gaia, and one of them is called The Five, Five Dharma Types. And more recently, we did an interview on his book called um, The Dharma Method. But what I wanted to do today was we're just going to have a fun and playful conversation so that we can give you some new tools to work with to evaluate your own life, your friends, your family, your spouses and so forth. So without further ado, let's go to Simon. Hi, Simon. Good to see you again. Hello, hello. Great to be here. Oh, we're going to have fun. Okay. I, I love it. That's well, what we're going to do. Okay. Yes, we are. And uh, we first had fun talking about the five Dharma types. And before we get into it, let's just have you explain why you wrote that book to begin with, what that was all about. Yeah, because I was lost. Um, so that book took uh, eight years to write, and the Dharma is your personal uh, mission in life. Why are we here on this planet? Why are we using up all these resources like food and, and space and time and energy over the course of a lifetime? It's a lot, and all the plastic bags we use, everything. Why are we here? Why is spirit, the universe, sort of fostering us to use all of these resources there must be some reason something incredible that the universe wants from us to create to to manifest for it to give us all of these resources so i was sitting there on on the couch you know thinking why am i just a lump of coal here uh, taking up space and that that led to meditation it led to interviews with very holy and saintly people it led to my own experimentation, reading lots of books. And eight years later came The Five Dharma Types, which is this very kind of funneling down the world's wisdom into this very basic diamond hard kind of form. So simple. Five personality types. And just like my hand, there are four that are the merchant, the warrior, the laborer, the educator. And then there's that good old thumb that points in the opposite direction called the outsider. And so the thumb can look like any one of the others. He can be, look like a warrior and so on. But really, he's free to do his own thing. And so what I was experiencing was an outsider period in my life. And I had no idea what, whether I should be a, a physical trainer, a salesperson, or God knows what. And um, by the way, it was none of those, but all of those led to what I was supposed to be, which is an educator, a teacher. Um, and you, you have to interrupt me because one trait of educators is, is we like to do blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so you're going to have to say, wait, 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 shut up for a second. Let me ask a question. You, you have the mic right now. Go ahead. Okay. So that book came out of my own questing for what is my purpose on this planet and, and how can I best serve it? And people will go, well, wait a minute, there's 7 billion people, five types, that's it? That's all you got? You know? Um, and I thought about that for a second when one interviewer asked me, and I said, well, listen, think about two types. Forget five types, two types, male, female, man, woman. What if you don't know your type? And by the way, this is a real issue for some people on the planet right now, right? Uh, gender identity. But most of us wake up in the morning knowing I'm a guy or I'm female or I'm male and we know what clothes to put on. We know, you know how to fix our hair and how, which bathroom to use at the, at the restaurant. But imagine if you didn't know that. And it's the same thing. If you don't know your Dharma type, it, you're wandering through the world going, oh, how do I act with my kids? Like, Should I be stern or should I be laissez-faire and let them do what they want? Should I go be a car mechanic? You know, you don't know. This is true, Simon, and a lot of people are asking themselves those questions all the time, really basic questions, not having any sense of where to start other than that I'm male or female, right? Yeah. And so tell us where those five Dharma types came from. Yeah, and so there are a lot of other categories, by the way. There's father-son or mother-daughter. There is a, a good spouse. Uh, you know, uh, single or, or, or married. And, and so we all have roles to play within those categories. But the most uh, uh, instructive, the most evolutionary models are these five Dharma types that I found. And they come, they really don't come from anywhere. I think they're in our DNA because they, they existed in Hawaii and in Polynesia. They existed in Europe at a certain time. 
but the culture that is fostered and developed in the most has been uh, the subcontinent of India, the Vedic culture. And unfortunately, in modern, in modern meaning the last 2,000 years, um, that has all, they've also devolved into political structures called the caste system. So you have the Brahmins, the educated caste, lording it over everybody else, going, hey, you're not a Brahmin, you can't touch me, right? That kind of thing, which is total nonsense. So, but nonetheless, India has so much ancient wisdom about these five archetypes. And when you try to, when you separate the, the racist and, and sort of a hierarchical qualities of it and to the pure essence, it's gold. It's like I struck gold and I said, okay, this is it. And then I started watching people. I would just be on the train and just watch people, how people behave. And I'd go, okay, this person is a warrior type. So this is how, how they're going to get off the train. This is how they're going to position themselves to achieve the goal, to be first, to be on it, on it. This person is a laborer type. They, they probably just finished 12 hours of work. They have a different aura about it. And in my interactions with students, I was also teaching at the time, I sort of perfected the system. It's still not perfect, but it's workable. And so that's the five Dharma types. And it's a, I mean, I think the book's like 20 bucks. Um, I, I, and again, not to be self-serving, but pick up the book. It's got so much more than I could tell you. It's like 400 pages. It is. <laughs> I read it, it sometimes and go, oh my God, this person must be a genius. Who wrote this thing? And I'm like, oh, that was me. Because it just flowed. The information flowed. So it's got a lot more than I can tell you, uh, you know, in, in 20 minutes, but yeah, check it out and hopefully it will change your life. I've gotten tons of emails from people going, Oh, thank you so much. Blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, you know, uh, it is very useful. I, I mean, I'll validate that. That's why I kept interviewing you. Every book you came out with, I kept saying, hey, come on, let's do this again. And here we are again. And this is kind of a compilation. We're going to kind of cut to all the really juicy bits, as they say, right? The juicy bits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just the good parts. Just the arias. <laughs> just the good parts. So first of all, um, tell people a little bit about each of the Dharma types. And also, I think they can go to your website and then do the test free right? We yeah. wait till the end of the interview. But if you're really, if you're like me and want instant gratification, you're probably going to go to the site right now. Anyway, press pause, press okay, pause, press pause, go to it, come back, watch yeah. the rest because there's some very cool applications. So, um, so where do they go to take the self test? Spirittype.com. All one word. Okay. All right. Now explain to us and you can use you and I as an example because you already know my type. You've seen my mm -hmm. chart and I know your type. And we can talk about how that shows itself, but also other people you know, some good examples of the other types as well. Go for it. Sure. Uh, so you and I are, uh, are kind of thumbs, uh, although, yeah, so the thumb is the outsider. And the outsider is, is the one who is, who is born to, to refresh society, um, hopefully in a good way, but it can be in a bad way as well. Uh, in a bad way, meaning a disruptive way that, that breaks things down. Give uh, us an example of somebody who is an outsider working in a disruptive fashion. Well, I wrote an article on my website uh, a, few year, a couple years ago called How Obama Led to Trump. And whatever your politics are, um, Obama was an educator type, philosophical, let's all work together, let's try to solve the problems in a communal way. This is the educator thinking. I'm also, an, uh, so I'm basically an educator who's lived his whole life in outsider periods. So I understand that. However, edu I write in the Dharma types, educators aren't the best leaders. Why? Because they're a little weak. They, they want everyone to get along. They, they're not the ones who are going to say, no, this is how it's done. And so where people perceived weakness, even though perhaps it wasn't, it was just intelligence and then they wanted something the polar opposite. So anyway, I wrote this article. So Trump is out and out outsider. And he is, now here's the cool thing. Countries like the U.S. go through different periods. Countries also have Dharma types. So we could talk about this for hours. So the U.S. is a merchant country. And in fact, even in the Constitution, we are guaranteed certain rights, life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness, joy, fun, this is the merchant's quality and goal in life. So we are very much a merchant country. But just about a year or two before Trump was elected, I think 2014 or, or 2015, we, at the United States, I should say, entered an outsider life cycle that's going to last for 18 years. Interesting. And, Wait a minute. Simon, is this based on our, the country's astrological chart? Yes. Okay. Yes. So now we're, good, we're getting deep into the woods. You said just the good parts, just the guitar solo. So here we go. Um, so, uh, so countries like people have a birth chart because they come into existence in a certain time and place. So in our case, 1776, July 4th in Philadelphia, if you want to know the official time, it's 6 30 PM. Okay. Based on that, we erect a chart. And how do I know that? I didn't come up with that. It was studied for six months. A famous astrologer named James Kelleher. JamesKelleher.com, he's an amazing Vedic astrologer, was paid a ton of money, supposedly, um, it's all hush-hush, to research the real chart of the U.S. Why? Because the people who wanted the chart are big-time investors, big-time, big people, because if they know the chart of where the country is going, they can bet on it or against it, and the markets and so on. So this is a whole thing that people do, and it's beyond my pay grade. I'm a lonely paper pusher on the computer, but there are people who work at that level. But anyway, so the U.S., based on its chart, entered a long outsider period, and what did it produce? An outsider president. And so it's kind of apropos, and by the way, it, exactly after he was elected, we had a major total solar eclipse slice the United States along the Mason-Dixon line. It was incredible. The, the path of the total solar eclipse from up from Oregon came down through Tennessee and literally, I mean, it couldn't, it, it, just right along the Mason-Dixon line wow. between north and south. So revisiting all those old wounds of the north and south. And so that set the tone for the presidency, unfortunately. Or fortunately, because it, it was bound to happen. 2,000 years ago, you could have predicted this eclipse would happen. Mm-hmm. So exactly. it was so a matter of time. So it did. We know that it has had a disruptive influence. With, regardless of anyone's politics, you can say we needed a disruptive influence. Yep. Because we're going into a changing time. So you took someone that was a representative of disruption and a high, highly influential individual to take us into this time. So that's one example of that. Um, and, we, and let's talk just for a moment about the positive um, influence of an outsider. Yes. So the, uh, Jesus, Buddha, there, Jesus walked into the temple and looked the, uh, uh, the, the priest, the head priest in the eye and said, Verily I say unto you, whores and tax collectors are entering heaven before you. Meaning, the, the people considered the lowest, uh, prostitutes and tax collectors, who were who worse actually, are going to go to heaven before you. Why? Because hypocrite. He called them out on their bull. Right. So what outsiders do at the highest level is, first of all, they disrupt society like he, like Jesus did. Buddha did as well. Buddha said, why can't women be nuns? Uh, why do the priests have all the power? They don't have all the power. Sit and meditate. The power is in you. Everything's in you. That was, uh, that was, uh, it, it was anarchy as far as the priests were concerned, the priestly class, right? Remember the priestly class, as I said, they were lording it over people? Yes. At, at that time, 600 BC, that was happening. So, um, so Buddha, Christ, outsiders, and, and to a lesser degree, we, you know, people who are in outsider cycles, we do the same thing, but these are the, the Dr. Martin Luther King outsider playing an educator as well. Gandhi outsider playing an educator. Their dharma is, is to disrupt the status quo in a way that wakes people up. Now, the second thing that outsiders do, and this is a big one, is they integrate East and West. They integrate things that nobody thought would fit together and make them fit together. Remember that old Thai bow thing where the guy did aerobics and Thai and boxing, mm -hmm. uh, Billy Blanks, the 
biggest selling uh, infomercial in the history of infomercials. That's what outsiders do. Um, that's what you're doing, right? Integrating east and west and different different things, you know, um, to... Yeah, I'm an outsider with the second influence of educator. You're the yeah. thumb who has decided to look like an index finger. But <laughs> yeah. anytime you want to, you can go... <laughs> Have fun and then come back to being. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, I understand that role pretty well. Okay, so I think we're kind of like, we're down with what the outsider is. Um, you've already hinted at the educator. Let's go just a little more into the educator, um, the positive and the challenged aspects of the educator. Educators uh, can be lusty. Um, educators, and you see a lot of educators fall because of that. Educator, you know, the priest or the, the senator or whatever. Um, and and educators falling for the students. Yes, yes. So they so and that comes from this this other weakness, which is they don't walk the walk. Oh, I'm an edge. Oh, I know what you should do. Yes, I know the principles. I understand perfectly. Okay, you can understand perfectly the principles of yoga, but if you don't get on the mat and actually do it, you're not going to see the benefit. That's our problem as educators, and so. Oh, I'll just have another donut and read, keep reading my book. And that's an educator in their comfort zone. So what kicks us out of the comfort zone is put that donut away for a second, get on the mat and actually do stuff. Follow up, live the, the truth that you are professing to others. Okay. So that's the positive and negative. Now let's go to, um, let's go to the, well, let's go to the merchant next. Because you've hinted at that already before we get to yes. the part, final two. Uh, so the merchant's dharma is, is to give charity to the world, to make people happy. I know it sounds so corny, but merchants are great at collecting, at creating value for themselves and others. So they're the ones who have the, the nice cars, the nice houses, the nice things. Even if they don't have those things, those things they value greatly. They, they're, they think about them all the time. To really manifest true value, you have to actually give those things. Merchants give energy to others. It can be a compliment. Hey, you look really nice today. It can be, uh, uh, you know, teaching someone how to flip a house because you've done it 10 times and it's so easy for you. And you see someone struggling, go, listen, here's what you do. That's the gift merchants have is to give value, create value for people. And, okay. and do, doing that, by the way, is their spiritual practice. Yes. It's so easy. I, I keep say, I've even said in my book and seminars, I've said next lifetime, I want to be born as a merchant. Why? Because all you have to do is make people happy. And that's your spiritual. You don't have to sit for eight hours in meditation and or read long sermons like the educator or do severe penance like the warrior. Just make people happy. <laughs> hey, I'm with you on that one. Okay. So let's go to the laborer. Because a lot of people think, oh, God, I hope I'm not a laborer. Because they're thinking of basically yeah. like nothing but a rock pile. But what's it actually mean? The laborer has the capacity to feel most deeply because they're most rooted and grounded in the earth. And so uh, laborer music, like the blues, like gospel, like traditional folk songs, are deeply rooted in family in, in a sense of belonging, in a sense of being part of something, of nature. Um, and laborers feel that more than any other type. So family and love, the power of love in a laborer is so intense that it, it, it eclipses everything uh, and every other type. Educators are in their head. Merchants, you know, are in, uh, in their... I, sort of digestive system, meaning they're hungry all the time for new experiences, uh, warriors in the muscles and the heart, but uh, the laborer is, is in the bones of the body and also the, the, the emotional heart because they feel everything so deeply. So their dharma, their purpose is to create a solid uh, evolutionary community to foster everyone else to grow. Without laborers, we wouldn't have cities, towns, uh, think about agriculture. It's the reason people settled down. We'd be nomads without the laborer. So what is the negatively impacted aspect of being a laborer? Dogma. 
uh, because something works for them, they think it should work for everyone. So, and unfortunately, you see this in politics as well. Uh, a well-meaning laborer, conservative or liberal, although laborers tend to be more conservative, uh, generally speaking, um, they'll say, nope, this is the way it's got to be. This is it, because they've experienced that in their life. Hard work, you know, you work hard, you'll get the reward. They have an experience living on skid row or being born to a crack mother, and so they can't sometimes empathize with that. So, no, no, get off your butt, pull yourself by your bootstraps, work hard, and you'll, you'll make it. Uh, no, sorry, that doesn't work for everyone. So some people need a little help. So anyway, laborers can get too stuck in an ideology. Yeah. Okay, finally, warriors. <laughs> warriors. Uh, they are the protectors. Uh, a warrior, whether you're a four foot tall, you know, 90 pound person or a six foot four bodybuilder, does not matter. The warrior's dharma is to protect those who can't protect themselves and to, uh, to lead. They're the natural leader. So right now, if something happened, you know, here, the warrior would be the first to stand up and say, hey, let's make this right. Or, hey, let's fix this issue. They're the fixers. They fix things. On the other side? Anger, uh, excessive pride, and warriors. Really, the biggest problem with warriors is that they are a Ferrari without a steering wheel. They, they've got so much power, but they don't know how to use it. And so they need guidance. They need to be steered in the right direction. Think about uh, a rebel without a cause, James Dean, who was a warrior type. Didn't have anything to put his energy into, so he drove fast, to push himself. Warriors love to push themselves. What if I climb that mountain? What if I do it at night? What if I do it while it's raining? Yeah, that'll be, that'll really push it. Because if they don't have something pushing them in their life, they're gonna go to these extremes. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. So I think people, if they haven't already come back from taking the test or getting a better idea, I mean, I personally, I think it's quite useful to understand these things about ourselves. Um, I like, I, I think everybody watching this likes typology of one kind or another, but what's nice about this is it's very direct and simple. But then again, as you say, there are overlays. You'll find that if you're taking that test, you might have maybe just one point more that favors one type than the next type, and maybe two or three that are call all in the running. And you can see these aspects of yourself, but you're saying if you look at your astrology, there are different times for those aspects yeah. of to become more prominent. So let's talk about how astrology plays into the suppression or stimulation of these traits. Well, to be honest with you, Regina, I'm really an astrologer. And what, what researching the five Dharma types in these other books has helped me realize is that's where my path is. As a communicator, as a consultant, but through the, the art of astrology. And so... I don't talk about the Dharma types in an educational way. I haven't done this like what we're doing in a while, um, but I do use it in my consulting practice. So I've taught the methodology to students to use. So I've had psychologists, I've had uh, you know yoga teachers, people in the wellness field, and, and MDs, doctors, and so on, learn this system along with the astrology so that when they can look but when they see a client, they see them from three dimensions. They see what the stars have to say. Then they see what their dharma type has to say. Then they see, you know, what their specialty, whether they're a physical trainer or, a, you know, psychiatrist. And so what chemical imbalances are. And then they create a really wholesome picture. So for me, astrology is my primary tool uh, for assessing clients and helping them find their way. Um, and so I use... Um, so astrology will help you see exactly where in the sort of course of the life the person is. And if they're in a little dip, you can tell them, hey, look, here's a dip. It's going to last another six months. But guess what? After that, there's a, uh, there's a mountain coming. So and that's when one type or the other may kick in? 
Yes. So you can tell a person, listen, you're in a labor period. In fact, I just told this to one of my students. Uh, she's in a labor period for the next two years. And she was complaining about uh, uh, cleaning the office. Like, uh, you know, she's in, a, she's in an office that she spent f four years in college at, and graduated top of her class in a field, very highly respected field, but she's in an office arranging things. And she's like, she was in tears. I can't believe it. This is what they want me to do. I went to school for this. And I said, listen, you fight for yourself, but also understand that you're laying the foundation. And here's the secret. I'll, I'll drop a little secret for laborers. The way to a laborer's heart is just to be present. It's not your words, your philosophy, your money, your nothing. You just go and you're there chest to chest, face to face, and you hang out. Hi, mom. So my mom's a laborer type. And just talking on the phone is good, but just spending that time, even though I, if I need to go somewhere, now I don't plan anything for two hours because I know I'm going to be there. They respect your presence, your yeah. time. And so, um, oh, so I told her, listen, you're putting in time at the office. The fact that you're there, believe it or not, is building your resume better than, you know, any other projects you could be doing right now. So just be there. Still fight for what you know, you know, and that's what she did. And she said, listen, I, I, I don't mind doing this. I'm very good at it, but I also have other skills. She said that to the boss. And I could be of much better use to you. When you're ready to use me, please do. And the next week, he gave her some bigger assignments. But... She's in a labor period, so it's got to be about work and just putting in the time and being there. The laborer's job is just to show up and be there for their kids, for their community, for yeah. their job, and that's how they earn the respect of their community. That's an interesting point you bring up um, when you're talking about how you can most appreciate or show your appreciation or for a, a type or how they enjoy being appreciated. So you just told us how to show up for a laborer. How, in looking at each other, how do we show up um, for, for a warrior, for example? Let's go through the other four types. How do yeah. we show up for them? Well, it depends on who you are. So for a warrior, um, if you're another warrior, you may challenge them. But typically, they're going to – warriors – you don't want a warrior to see you as an enemy or, or as a as an obstacle. Correct. Yeah. What what you want to show up to a warrior as is as a counselor, as a source of wisdom, and as one and, and to be as firm in your wisdom as possible because they'll test you. So you go to your warrior friend. And he's like, I can't believe these politicians. You know the earth is flat, right? It's definitely flat. I mean the evidence is there. Well, actually, let's take a look at the evidence, and then you show them the evidence and. You're not partial to it one way or another. You just know that the earth is not flat. And so they need to be disabused of their ignorance if they want to be. And you're just giving them the correct information. After a test or two, they'll realize, oh, I'm an idiot. This person knows their stuff. And then they revere and respect you. So you don't challenge the warrior. You give them the truth. Okay. Now let's talk about the merchant. The merchant, this, this, is, this is a good one. Um, again, with the mer see, merchants can be highly volatile. They, you can't out-cool uh, them. Merchants are cool. Think about Muhammad Ali. Think about uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe. I know these are old examples, but these are birth charts of people who have passed. And I, I don't like to use really modern, too many modern examples because it's sometimes unfair. Um, but these are people who are cool, who are, uh, who have so much energy and charisma. You can't out charisma them. What you can do is be, uh, again, firm and solid in basically be a laborer because merchants are always reaching for that new exciting thing for that new experience. And when you show them that things can be exciting without, you know, being at the nightclub at 4 a.m. every night, things could still be exciting being home watching TV. When you show them groundedness can be, ex maybe not exciting, but it can be joyful. 
Mm-hmm. You bring them down and they begin to appreciate you. Okay, educator, and then go on to outsider. Educator, um, they respect people who walk the walk and talk the talk because they'll know more than you, so you're not going to out, you know, data them or out quote them. You quote the Bible, they'll quote you three other verses. You know, you quote modern politics, they know what's going on. You simply show that you are actually living the the truth that they are that they are talk speaking. And so, with your discipline and seriousness and uh, in that, in not being a non hypocrite, educators when they see that they go, "Wow, this person's the real deal." Okay, outsiders. Outsiders, tell the truth to yourself. Outsiders love to tell everybody else, you're fake news, you're this, you're that, this is what's going on with them. This is, they never, see, when there's one finger pointing this way, there's three pointing back at you. You have to remember that there's three fingers and to look at the mirror yourself. And this is what Jesus did. And this is why one of his most famous saying is, before you go to pluck the, uh, uh, the, the, the speck from your neighbor's eye, take the log out from your own, right? And this is why he spent 40 days, 40 nights, you know. Or, by the way, it wasn't 40 days and 40 nights. It, that's an expression that means a long-ass time. Mm-hmm. It could have been longer than 40 days. It could have been less than 40 days, but it was a long time. Um, or it could have been 40 days, but uh, at that time, that was an expression, a literary expression for a very long time, um, to cleanse himself and to see through his own bull, right? So when they say the devil tempted him, it's his own ego saying, man, you are so powerful. You could rule all these people. Why are you here starving? You're not tempting, right? That he cleaned himself. My, my point is outside... And no one is going to be fully clean. I'm sorry. No one's going to pass the test. But to just keep doing it every day. Look at those three fingers pointing back at you. Okay. Now, we're going into a whole different area, which is, again, the use of both the types and the astrology. And we talked about this in an interview we did not long ago at Gaia. And um, I found it fascinating because it's the one book we didn't really get into. But you took all of this and you decided to see what would happen in what turned out to be essentially betting and set this up a little bit for people because it's what happened with this that was so fascinating to me. So let's get into your adventures in betting with astrology and Dharma types. Well, first of all, let me set this up by saying that I'm a bit of a closet tantric. And what that means is that Tantrics like to use extreme situations, things that are supposedly really not good for you, to test their own purity. So gambling is one of the, I mean, it's one of the things in traditional Vedic uh, culture that one of the sins that you can't expunge in a lifetime. That and killing your guru. Like those are the two big sins. And so, um, although having said that, many of the great kings and famous people in that culture were gamblers. Um, Nonetheless, gambling is a very powerful, potentially addictive pursuit. And it definitely does not bring out the best in people, especially when they're losing. And I'm sure you've been around, you know, in that environment uh, at times and very seemingly normal people lose their hat because a lot of dopamine, there's a lot of stuff going on in your system. So what tantric people, and I'm not saying I'm a tantric, but I have certain leanings. I'm a a wannabe. Um, They're interested in those intense situations because they test your equanimity. So tantrics will also eat meat. They will also have sex and test, use that because so much emotions and hormones are going on during that. So they'll do their breathing practice while while they're making love to to open and make that a powerful experience. So gambling is one of those things. And it, it wasn't something I chose, it just happened. I pulled the chart for a game, I predicted who would win, it happened, I did it again and again and again. And I said, oh my God, this astrology stuff works. And of course, <laughs> I had been an astrologer already for 10 years, but there was proof in black and white. 
And it's, it's interesting because you had said, this also gets into some other aspects of mind because you had said to yourself, okay, so if I'm going to make a game out of this, how much should I put as the winnings at the end of it? And as I recall, it was something like $30,000. Yeah. So let's cool. talk about what you started out with and how long it took by using the principles and the astrology applied to games. In this case, it was, was it football? Or it was soccer because it was the soccer, World Cup. Right, at soccer. The time. Okay, go and ahead. I was a lonely Sanskrit teacher at the time, and we, you know, teachers in general don't make a lot of money. So fifty bucks was a lot, believe it or not. It may sound crazy, but fifty bucks I had to hide away and put it in to test my theories. And by the way, why did I have to do that? Because it shows that you made the prediction beforehand. Everyone can say, "Oh yeah, I knew, I knew Trump would win." Yeah. Okay, but did you actually say that beforehand? So this is one way to show your prediction. Anyway, uh, so 50 bucks, I put it into a, an online thing. You get a bonus, so I got a bonus of 25. So I started with $75. And one thing about uh, Tantra is that it's a spiritual science. So you need a guru, you need a teacher, or you need a spiritual guide. And so this is where it gets a little woo-woo, but I sort of you know, a day or two after starting this, I, I looked at the, the picture of a spiritual teacher whom I admire, and it's almost like she spoke to me and she said, all right, you can do this. How much do you want to win? I have $75 in my account, 50 that I've put in. And I'm thinking, I don't know, 25,000, 30,000. Like that seemed like so much. And it was, and I, I felt like I was reaching for the moon. And I almost felt like, hmm, okay. And then the connection shut off. And I was like, what happened? I don't know what happened. Did I say something wrong? You know, that's what I was thinking in my head. Well, six weeks later, I had 30,000 bucks in my account. And that was following? Following uh, betting. The, the moment the games began, right? Yes. The location of the game, I assume the location and the time of the game. Yes. And then how did you analyze each of the teams? Because we're going to get uh, into this on a personal relationship level in a minute. Yes. So you and I have a lifetime. Let's say 100 years. Ayurveda, the science of life, the Vedic uh, science of self-healing says our lifespan is 120 years. That's the optimal human lifespan. So let's just go with that. Um, your horoscope reflects that lifespan. A game has a lifespan of two hours. Its horoscope reflects that. So you can look at the horoscope of a game, and because the lifespan is so short, you can see the very salient points. Is the favorite team going to win or are they going to lose? Is this person going to be successful or a disappointment in their life? You know, it's a, but in a game, it's so such a tiny little lifespan, it's easy to make it binary, win or lose, and sometimes draw. So I would look at the chart and go, oh, this is a win. And some, oh, no, this is a loss. And that was it. It's very simple. You cast a chart of a game the way you cast a chart of a person because it starts at a particular place, at a time, and, uh, uh, and a date. And those are the only three things you need. And the three things you need for a person, a marriage, uh, or a rugby match. Okay, so, um, and you were almost 100% on those? You would have to so, be that amount of money in six weeks, pretty high percentage of wins. I was, uh, I was, I did very well the first uh, few months, and I attribute part of that to beginner's luck, and I attribute part of that to that very strong sort of spiritual connection I had. Then I got cocky. Then my educator brain said, oh, I figured out a system how to do this, and I started relying less and less on the spiritual side, and so I started losing. And then so then it, it kind of went up and up. So I, I did this for a couple of years while I was writing the book, but I stayed at, I would say around 66 to 70%. So on a good day, I was almost perfect. On a bad day, I was at 50%. To give you an idea, professional gamblers would kill to be at 59 or 60% because it means they're making a, a really good living. Yeah. Well, and you were making a really good living, but no matter what you did, how much you made, you only walked away with 30000 in the end, right? Not yeah. only, but you did walk away with yeah. exactly what you asked for. 
Pretty much, yeah. So look, I still sometimes, I mean, I gave it up officially because it, it's, it really is a job. You have to follow, mm -hmm. you have to look at charts all day long. You have to know what teams are doing, also rely on intuition, have that spiritual connection. And I asked I, myself, do, you, do I really want to do this for a living? And the answer was clearly no. And so there's no silver bullet. Uh, I did write a book on it. I have a course on it on my website. It's a private course. But I tell people, listen, this is not a silver bullet. So if you think you're going to read this book and become a millionaire by betting, you could, but you've got to put so much effort into it, like anything yeah. else. Right. Okay, let's go to the personal relationship part, because you and I were talking about that after our last interview. And you were talking about how even casting the day and time someone chooses to get married can trump a so-so connection versus having a really strong a really strong connection and a bad time or a so-so connection and a good time. So I kind of I'm trying to, you know what I'm trying to say, yeah. so I can explain that. So I'm going to say something that really may sound very revolutionary and unbelievable to, to people out there. And, and I, I'll just ask you to suspend your disbelief for five minutes um, un, un, until I explain the trick, how the trick is done. You know, the magician says, I'm going to yeah. walk on water, and they do it, and you go, what? But no, here's how it's done. There's a methodology to this. Um, and so what I'm going to say is that regardless of how much you love each other in your relationship, the moment, there are stages in a relationship. The moment of your first kiss begins the sort of dating phase, right? That uh, we're officially now kind of a couple. And that has its own chart. That moment in the time and place of the first kiss is going to sort of set the scene. Then the moment you first make love takes your relationship to a new level, right? So that has its own chart. So now that chart supersedes the old one, the kiss chart. The moment you become engaged, ah, your relationship is now on a new level. Now the sex chart is out of the way. You have a new chart, new relationship. And then the moment you get married is the most important one because that's not only a, a spiritual connection, it's a legal contract. A binding contract and the moment you enter into that now you have a new chart so it's so important to have a chart that is well aligned for partnership have you ever I don't know if you've had friends or people you know great they were dating and the moment they got engaged everything started going wrong yeah They're like what happened we were now we're yesterday we were laughing today we're fighting or the moment they get married vice versa Sometimes it acts the other way, a so-so couple, but you know, they're about to break up. This is in the movies. And the guy says, will you marry me? And he said it at right the right time. And she said, yes. And they live happily ever after, even though they were about to break up before then, because that happened at an auspicious time. So what I'm going to say here is that the moment you do and start anything, has an influence on how that thing plays out. It doesn't supersede the compatibility, the true love you have for each other. That's, there's another way to measure that, believe it or not, astrologically. We're coming out with an app. Okay, I'm gonna- I love it. I'm, we're gonna officially call it out here. I swear, this is the first time I'm saying it's called Sizzle. It'll be out in about six months or so. And do you have Sizzle, right? And you're going to be able to see if you have sizzle with celebrities, you know, do, you have, do I have sizzle with Madonna? And I can just, boom, click, put my info, and it will show you what are the, how I compare. What are the on, sizzle factors? I what are the sizzle that. factors? It's going to be wildly popular, Simon. I hope so. And you know what? My goal is to help people have that chemistry and, and create the right timing. Anyway, so that's one, you can measure that, but the timing is also important. And, and these days I'm doing it for Bitcoin as well. So last year, one of my clients, I knew nothing about Bitcoin. And he said, Simon, is it going to go up or down? I'm an astrologer. No question is out too, too far out of the box. So I pull up the chart and I look at the times, the planet Saturn, which rules constriction, uh, uh, harsh discipline problems, was about to enter the part of the zodiac that rules the sound 
B, B I. I saw that it could not be more clear. And I said, listen, starting this, he, this was in late 2017, about uh, November. I said, listen, starting around January, February, this thing is going down. There's no way. It and it did, it crashed, uh, but at first it went really high. So as it was going high, the guy was going, you're totally wrong. But then it went down. So, um, so now astrologically we're following Bitcoin. And by the way, those who are interested, um, Jupiter moves into that sound B. Jupiter is a planet of expansion starting in November of 2019. So the end of 2019 should be very positive for Bitcoin. Uh, and then 2020, uh, Saturn releases his brakes. So Jupiter is the gas, Saturn is the brakes, Saturn is off the brakes. End of 2019, beginning of 2020 should be very bullish for Bitcoin. There's my prediction. All right. Thank you for that. And especially for those in, involved in Bitcoin already. Only, but also only based on astrology. Bitcoin. Yeah, only based on astrology. Okay, not whatever else could happen in the world, the markets and other yes. external influences. But um, one thing I wanted to bring up that you and I had talked about is that if you did marry someone at a disadvantageous time and it's putting a stress on your relationship, you said ah, not to worry. Uh, your sizzle app and other ways you can do it in other ways. Well, actually someone could even at, consult you. You can get married again, dissolve that old contract, remarry yeah. again at the perfect optimal time and see if it's a little smoother, right? Well, yeah. And you don't even, you don't have to get divorced. You just renew your vows. Ah. It's a recontract. So you don't have to, I mean, yeah, you don't have to nullify the first one. Remember what I said after the first kiss, the first lovemaking automatically nullifies it. So you just renew the vows at a time that's auspicious. And uh, I'll give you an example. A, a client of mine, she got married. Uh, she's Indian. Her husband is American. And actually, her parents insisted that the astrologer pick the date. And she said, you know, we're having problems. Uh, and, and actually, actually, she didn't even say anything. She said, can you look at our charts? And I said, is this happening? She said, yes. Is this, this, this? She said, oh, my God, yes, that's exactly what's happening. And I said, well, I'll need to see the marriage chart because I think you guys are compatible, but there's something off. So she sent me the marriage chart and it was perfect. I'm like, wait a minute, this, this is, and she said, yeah. And we had a priest do it. And I said, oh, right. Well, the priest did a very good job, the astrologer. She said, but you know what? We celebrated it again for his family because we had the whole two days later. Yeah. I said, oh, God, show me that chart. And lo and behold, it was a terrible chart. And so, and it described what was happening in there. It had become all about work for them. The romance was gone and still they cared for each other. They were friends, but that passion was missing. And, and that's, the chart was all about Saturn, responsibility and, and career and so on. And I said, listen, just renew your vows and it'll be fine. You, you guys will be fine. And that was it. So it's not like the love was missing. It's just that they had the TV. They were just on, it was just on a channel that wasn't getting reception. So we just right. got to change the channel. You don't have to get a new TV. Well, I think this is a really fun conversation because I'm sure there are a lot of people thinking, oh my God, we've got to get, we've got to renew our vows. <laughs> well, <laughs> or at least pick a good date to start from for those who haven't gone that far yet. But I love it. I just love that story. I love the fact that there's always renewal. And again, we can't, we can't hang our hat on just one thing in life, but it's a pretty good uh, basis to start from. So I like that part of it. Also, uh, in the latest book that you've done, The Dharma Method, it's really wonderful because you talk about, you know, lifestyle, that how we each live as our Dharma type, and right down to how we meditate, how we interact with others, um, how we choose to exercise or not, the kind of foods we eat. It's a wonderfully useful book uh, once you are feeling comfortable with your particular type. Maybe just expand on that for a minute or two before we say goodbye. Okay. Um, and, and can I, I just want to clarify what we just talked about because it's not all about micromanaging. You do, uh, uh, there are people who will micromanage their lives by looking at the chart and trying to find the absolute perfect moment to go to the bathroom, you know, to eat uh, their donut. To, no, no, no. This is a, a, a tool... And so, honestly, the best 
time to do anything is when it really comes deep from your heart. And you know that example I just gave of the person saying, will you marry me? Because it, it just bursts forth. The universe is asking the question. And when you do things that way, when you have presence, the Buddha didn't look at astrology charts. But what the Buddha and very wise people did is they, they were present in themselves and they understood this is the right time to do this. This is not the right time. And we all have this deep inner wisdom. And the goal is just to check in with it. And by the way, in the, the Dharma method, I give you the, the best methods used by the spiritual people in the past. Not me. I'm nobody. But the, you know, the, the, the yogis, the great saints uh, from every tradition, what they use to get in touch with their inner knowing. And when you have that, honestly, you don't need astrology. My teacher used to say the astrologer's job is to put themselves out of business. Meaning you, you help a person center themselves so well that they don't need you anymore. They can make their own damn decisions in life. Same for a doctor. Ideally, the doctor's job is to put themselves out of business. They teach you how to maintain health, how to take care. It can happen over a course of many sessions, but at a certain point, you don't need them anymore if and unless there's some an emergent or emergency. And so I don't want to paint ast astrology and me as like, oh, I, I have your life in my hands. You can plan everything in your day. It's only a crutch. So the Dharma method is all about helping you find that space inside. Okay? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I love it. And I always enjoy your books. They're always very approachable. And uh, there's, I think everyone watching these interviews likes to see kind of where they fit into the picture and how they can work with something, whatever the subject is. And you give people a lot to work with. So on that note, one more time, your website? Spirittype.com. Very good. Well, listen, I know we caught you on vacation, and it was really nice of you to take a little time to talk with Thank us. Thank you, Regina. So, good to see you again, Simon. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Enjoy see. your vacation. You Bye for now. Bye-bye. Everybody again, Simon Chikoisky. You can go to spirittype.com. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com.